Hello, my name is Patrick Lawhon, and today I'll be performing The Box That Made the World Smaller. Can you believe this? We drive all night, three of us sit here on the dock for 12 damn hours before a single bale of cotton gets unloaded. At this rate, we're going to miss our next pickup in North Carolina. If those damn longshoremen took any longer, we'd grow old and die right here in our trucks. You know, I've been, I've been thinking about this for a while now. I think I've got an idea. Now just hear me out, Ralph. So we sit here waiting because those longshoremen muscle every crate, bale, and bundle from our trucks, load them onto the slings, and then lift them into the hold of the ship. Then on board, everything is done all over again in reverse. What a waste of time and money. Hell, this is the way they did it back in ancient Rome. So now just think about this. What if they just put the whole trailer on the ship? Then at the other end, they could lift the trailer off the ship and drive it away. Think about how much time it would save. We could have all of our cargo unloaded and a new trailer hooked up in a fraction of the time. It was on that late November day, while waiting in his truck in the port at Hoboken, New Jersey, that in Malcolm McLean's own words, the seed was planted for containerization. That seed would eventually develop into the global transportation and logistics system that would help change the way the world does business. Eighteen years later, after securing his own fortune, McLean took the first steps to putting his plan into action. Clara, James, now you know I've wanted to launch a shipping business using containers for a while now. But the law won't allow a trucking company to own a shipping company. Well, I've got an opportunity to buy Pan-Atlantic Shipping. Here's what I propose. Let's sell the trucking company and use Pan-Atlantic to implement my container design. Now, I've worked with engineers to design a container that can be dropped right down onto a flatbed trailer or a rail car or a ship. They'll be packed to the factory and not unloaded until they reach their destination. Not only will it reduce the time it takes to load and unload ships, but it will also reduce damage to the goods. Hell, the longshoremen can't even steal stuff out of them like they do now. You know what they say. A longshoreman's pay is $20 a day and all the scotch you can bring home. We'll make them out of corrugated metal. Eight feet wide, eight feet tall, 35 feet long. The longest length that's permitted in each state. There'll be doors on one end for loading and unloading. But the strength lies in the design of the eight corners that will direct the weight of the stacked containers to the four vertical bars of the frame, which are the strongest part of the box. And we've even designed a twist lock mechanism to allow them to be stacked easily. <laughs> I've already got the patents for my container design. I know, Clara. Andrew Higgins tried this, and he failed. But that's because he didn't have the business capital to make it work. But that won't be a problem for us. Once we sell the trucking company, we'll have plenty of cash. Now, the Army got closer in World War II with the Konex boxes. But they were too small. There are two keys to making this work now. First, the box needs to be big enough to be efficient and still fit on a truck or a rail car. Now, second, we need to get everyone in the world to use the same containers so that any container can be handled by any port and put on any ship. Ports will have to make an investment in equipment for loading and unloading the boxes, so they have to be standardized. But I've already offered my patents to the International Organization for Standardization, royalty free, so that our design can become the world standard for everyone to use. Just think, no more idle trucks just sitting on the dock waiting to be unloaded. Ships will be in and out of ports in a day instead of weeks. You know, ships only make money when they're out at sea, not when they're just sitting in a port. Shipping will be faster, cheaper, and more efficient. Now, this won't be easy. We'll have to convince trucking, rail, and shipping companies, and the regulators, to go along with it. <laughs> but once they see how it works, I think they'll go for it. The time is right for this to work. Since World War II, consumer demand for manufactured goods has taken a hold on America. Demand is increasing dramatically each year. This is the cheapest way to get the goods from the factories to the people. In 1956, Malcolm McLean's ship, the Ideal X, set sail with 58 containers on board and became the first ship to use containerized cargo as we know it today. Despite that first successful voyage, many obstacles remained in McLean's way, including the unions. Harry Bridges, head of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union for 40 years, fought containerization tirelessly. I knew I should have agreed to do this. Damn reporters are always late. All right, come in. 
Let's get this over with. Yeah, I knew what containerization meant for our members right away. As soon as shipping started going over to containers, longshoremen were getting laid off left and right. We had to fight to protect our workers. But after a few years, we also realized that containerization was inevitable. You know, as, as much as I hate that bastard McLean for what he did to my workers, now I have to respect him. And he didn't just create a metal box. He created an entirely new system of handling freight. Now they call it intermodalization or something like that. He understood that the shipping industry is about moving cargo, not ships. Every part of the system had to change, had to be streamlined. And I'll be damned if that isn't exactly what he did. So in 1960, we negotiated an agreement that at least made the shipping companies provide a fund for our workers who got laid off. In return, we basically allowed containerization to move forward. Yeah, we knew containers would catch on eventually. The Vietnam War really got them off the ground. The military wanted a more efficient way to get supplies to their troops in Vietnam, and McLean was eager to prove himself. He even sent over the first shipments for free. Of course, the military loved McLean's containers, gave him big fat military contracts. <laughs> but McLean, you know, he was no dummy. He didn't want his ships just coming back empty from Asia. So he had them stop off in China and Japan on their way. Started what's now one of the most heavily traveled trade routes in the world. Look around. We see the impact of containerization every single day. Suddenly the world in 1990 is a lot smaller than it was in 1956. Shipping is so much faster and cheaper that companies have no problem buying products made in Asia and shipping them all the way here to America. Americans are losing their jobs because now it's cheaper to make a product in Asia and ship it here than, than to make it right down the street. The trends Harry Bridges saw 20 years ago have accelerated. The world in 2010 is even smaller than it was in 1990. The impact of McLean's containers on the global economy is even more evident today. Good morning class. Welcome to Introduction to Logistics and International Supply Chain Management. Let's jump right in. Now let's say you're a a bright young manager at a manufacturing company in the Midwest with several nearby factories making your components and assembling your finished product. Now business was great for a long time, but competitors have started to undercut your prices. You've cut your expenses to the bone at your factories, but profits are shrinking each year. What do you do next? Yes, what's your name? Well, Rachel, you're right. One strategy might be to outsource some or all of your production to an overseas location where labor rates are lower than in the U.S. But what about the cost of shipping? Now, who knows what percentage of the total price of a product made in Asia but sold here in the U.S. is accounted for by shipping and transportation? Well, I'll just tell you. The cost of international shipping now accounts for less than 1% of the total price of a product. That's right, less than 1%. Prior to containerization, it was 15%. 20 million containers are moving around the world at this moment, carrying 95% of the goods brought into the U.S. Today, if you use it, play it, plug it in, or wear it, it probably reached you via a shipping container. By making shipping costs a non-issue, containerization has made the world smaller. All kinds of products are now made in low-wage countries and exported to the rest of the world. But what has that meant? Well, containerization paved the way for big box discount stores such as Walmart and Best Buy. And while containerization may allow you to buy less expensive TVs, appliances, computers, and clothes, it also had a negative impact on many people. As companies outsource production to other countries, factory workers in America and Europe find themselves out of work. While containerization may allow you to buy a 42-inch flat-screen TV at Costco for only $749. It also may have caused the Zenith TV factory in your hometown to close. Now, as you do your reading for tomorrow, I want you to think about the nuts and bolts of the international supply chain for a hypothetical company. But also, think about all the implications of these innovations. Containerization is one of the greatest innovations of the past 100 years. The shipping container is the box that made the world smaller, bringing about a worldwide revolution in manufacturing and distribution, the impact of which is felt every day. 
Because of Malcolm McLean's vision and persistence, we now have the global economy that Adam Smith believed was necessary for capitalism to truly work efficiently. Thank you.